all the depreciation recapture, as well as the capital gains. You know, ideally, if your property has gone up in value, you might actually have some appreciation as well. Welcome. This is the Hot Real Estate Investing Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping others through real estate investing. Our hosts interview guests from all aspects of real estate investing who generously share valuable experiences and advice. Whether you're starting out or an experienced investor, this is the show for you. Hello and how's it going? My name is Travis Shelton and welcome to the Hot Real Estate Investing Podcast where I interview guests who want to help others investing in real estate. We keep these podcasts fun and full of value and looking forward to a really good tax discussion with Justin Shore. Uh, He's the advisory manager at Hall CPA, also known as the real estate CPA and a real estate investor with about 10 years of real estate investing experience. Justin, thanks for joining me again today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Travis. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I invited you on because, you know, I've been talking to you about some bonus depreciation and a multifamily asset I've been looking at. And obviously, one of the biggest questions and one of the biggest positives of real estate investing are some of the tax savings and advantages. And you hear about them all the time. And so, you know, I invited you on and, and we've talked, you know, pre show about what kind of value we want to be able to provide the audience. But before we kind of deep dive into bonus depreciation or just depreciation in general, can you give the audience a little bit more background about yourself and maybe kind of your role as the advisory manager at Hall CPA? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I kind of, I was always interested in real estate, even in, you know, the years ago when I was in college and I had even dabbled with the idea of, uh, you know, buying a property because I thought it would be cheaper than, you know, renting uh, or whatnot. And at the time, you know, I just thought that uh, I had no idea how strong the rental market was, especially in the area where I was going to college. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, always, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look back and think, man, I, I wish I would, would have done that and started my investing career a lot sooner. Um, but uh, the first few years after I got out of college, I kind of did like the typical large corporate type of experience or whatnot. Um, worked for a couple of Fortune 500 companies doing this like private accounting and taxes and stuff like that. Um, but then uh, around like 2014, I was uh, um, uh, you know lucky enough to uh, work for a real estate investment trust is mm-hmm. what really kind of started causing me to have like more of that real estate itch that I had to scratch was being around all these uh, you know the, the founders there are very entrepreneurial and obviously dealt in real estate a lot. So um, that was when I finally uh, scratched that itch and started investing in real estate myself. No, but being an accountant and being, uh, you know, more geared towards taxes, I, uh, of course, started looking into that and educating myself more in depth on real estate specifically. And um, I did a lot of, uh, you know, several years of just kind of general practitioner type of work. But um, I always gravitated more and more towards real estate and started having more and more clients that were real estate investors. So eventually I kind of uh, basically decided to, you know, jump off that cliff, so to speak, and said, you know what, I'm why, why am I working, you know, dealing with all these other industries that I'm not as interested in? Um, I want to do just real estate so I can really, really hone my skills in that area. Um, and I started doing that. And then um, shortly around after uh, I started specializing in solely just real estate and tax consulting um, is when I came across real estate CPA. And uh, I thought to myself, man, these guys are, you know, very like-minded individuals. They approach the client experience the same kind of way that I do. Um, and, and I love kind of like the no-nonsense approach and giving, you know, clients the information they need to make good investments uh, from, you know, from a tax perspective. <laughs> and uh, eventually got connected with them uh, about two years ago now. I've been with the firm and uh, I, I love it. I love what we do there. My role in the advisory department, like I said, I'm, uh, now I'm managing a team of advisors. Um, I do still meet with clients though as well, is we are just working one-on-one with uh, investors like yourself um, to provide guidance and basically uh, guide th- people through the tax strategies that are going to be the most valuable to them, um, you know, to achieve their goals. Usually it's expanding their real estate portfolio. I mean, that's always like somewhere in the mix, Um, but uh, it is, you know, varies from person to person. So like our job is really to figure out like, you know, what is your situation? Like what's, what's going on with you specifically? Mm -hmm. And then tell you like, Hey, this is, these are the strategies that you can most, or that you can best tap into and just kind of like what fits into their situation and everything. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of my biggest 
proponents or, or, you know, positives that I can always express about uh, your company is it's the individualization, right? It's looking at my specific situation and making a, a specific plan for me and my wife and our family on how we can, you know, expand our portfolio, also save taxes and, and what things we should be shooting and looking for in the future, right? When we talked mm -hmm. real estate professional status for Aaron and it was like, hey, maybe not this year, but maybe next year, right? Or hey, as you mm -hmm. as you transition to doing this, or if you had one or two more units, we could probably get over that threshold. So I love that proactive planning. And like, we just had a call what in June, um, you know, and taxes were due in April. And, you know, I, I always extend mine. So they're due in October, but we're tax planning for 2023, you know, mm -hmm. already in June, which, which is, I love that proactive approach and, you know, kind of a cool story for you, somebody that can like, like niche into real estate and then kind of like do your full-time job, learn from a bunch of different real estate investors, right? Learn all these different things. Yeah. And so it's like almost you get, like you get to learn for fun and say like, what do I like to do as an investor, but then also learn for your clients. So I love that kind yeah. of aspect of, um, of your role and kind of a cool, cool gig to get into, right? Like I loved real estate. So I got into, I became a realtor, right? Just so I could see more real estate and be around real estate all the time. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. I think I think it'd be like, you know, if, if you're, uh, you know, if, if you're like a classic car buff or whatnot, and you become a mechanic, like the same yeah. kind of thing of like, you know, just part of it is, yeah, doing what you love, but, you know, getting immersed in something that you enjoy and then going, oh, okay, if there's, there's some value in this, I can share it with other people, you know? Yeah. No, it's awesome. So we normally start our show off with some motivation, but there is no bigger motivation in life than keeping more of the money that you earn. <laughs> And so that's the motivation for this show. And so we want to transition right into our main topic, Justin, and how can you help our audience of real estate investors today? Specifically, I really want to dive, deep dive into depreciation concepts. And mm -hmm. so for our audience that maybe isn't as familiar with depreciation or bonus depreciation, what is bonus depreciation and how can you use it on your tax return? Yeah. So when we're talking about real estate specifically, um, your depreciation is pretty much always going to fall into if you're looking at if you're looking at residential versus non-residential property and uh, residential property gets depreciated over 27 and a half years. Non-residential gets depreciated over 39 years. So which which is relatively slowly. Um, yeah. and, and what that really is, is when you purchase a property. The value of that property, it's it's not immediately deductible. As you could probably imagine, if you bought like a five hundred thousand dollar house, IRS isn't going to let you just take a five hundred thousand dollar deduction in the first year. That would be great, yeah. um, but because uh, you'd be able to generate a large tax loss immediately there. Um, but so what they do is they make you spread those deductions out, and and that's via the method of of depreciation. Okay. So um, when we get into bonus depreciation, it's almost kind of like uh, you can think of it as like an enhanced version of depreciation. Uh, we, we would refer to it as accelerated depreciation. Okay. Um, just actually more probably accurate uh, way to refer to it because that's, that's yeah. exactly what we're doing is we're speeding up some of that accelerate or uh, we're accelerating some of that depreciation that would normally be taken over 27 and a half or 39 years. And we're going to do it in a shorter amount of time. Okay. And the, the way that we will do that with real estate is we have to have a cost segregation study done. And the purpose of that study is to break out what are the other components of the building that aren't 27 and a half year uh, lifespans. And one thing I always tell clients too, when we're talking about this, like cost segregation studies to be able to accelerate the depreciation with these shorter class lives is not mm -hmm. all of this. Well, a lot of times IRS doesn't make a lot of logical sense, but <laughs> sometimes it's good for you when they don't. And sometimes it's not so good for you. Um, but the reason why I say that is the two main categories or class lives of property that cost seg is going to break out is your five and 15 year uh, components of the building. Okay. And five year property, why like a, a good example of something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense is say like kitchen cabinets would be five year property. Okay. Um, that's why I'd say like something like that's very beneficial for the taxpayer because in reality, well, we're, uh, the cabinet should last a lot longer than five years. Uh, but sure, IRS would be nice letting you depreciate them faster and letting you take it over five years instead of 27 and a half or 39. Um, now how this all correlates to bonus depreciation yeah. is you can only take bonus depreciation on assets that have a class life of 20 years or less. Um, so the five and 15, of course, being the ones that are going to fall into that category. Um, now, uh, 
The other thing that we do have to uh, take into consideration, especially this year, one of the big changes to bonus depreciation was that in 2018 through 2022, it was 100%. Yep. This year, in 2023, it's 80%. So okay. what that means is we can only take bonus depreciation on 80% of that five and 15 year property as opposed to 100%. So you're not getting quite all of that five and 15 year property in the first year, but you're getting a overwhelming majority of it. Now, do you get any of that? Do you get that 20% back? Or I know it steps down, you know, year after year until it really hits zero, right? Mm -hmm. no? Yeah, okay. and okay. that makes it, it's a little bit harder uh, without, you know, using like a spreadsheet or calculator to really map all the numbers out. But the remaining twenty okay. percent of that yeah. um, uh, of that five and fifteen year property that's not being bonus, you do still get to depreciate that. It's just that okay. that remaining twenty percent of the five year property is going to be depreciated over five years, and the same okay. thing, remaining twenty percent of the fifteen year property is going to be depreciated over fifteen years as well. And now, are there pretty clear guidelines on like what is five year? You know, what is fifteen year? What is over? You know, twenty. Or 30 years, you know, that like a, an investor can go mm -hmm. and look at and say, okay, cabinets, flooring, paint, that's all five years. So like almost prioritize doing those rehabs to, to capture this uh, depreciation or um, is it a little bit more uh, ambiguous? That's a really good question. Um, it's, it, it can be ambiguous. The IRS does uh, outline those categories in very, actually very, very granular specific details. Okay. Um, I forget exactly how many different categories they actually have for describing like depreciable property. Um, it's a couple hundred. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when we're when we're talking about you know like rental real estate more specifically, um, the the bigger items that we'll typically see are going to be like like five year property being um, yeah stuff like cabinets, countertops, certain types of flooring. That's where we start getting into like the ambiguous parts. Like there's some okay. types of flooring that are going to be five year. There's other types of flooring that are 27 and a half slash 39 year. Okay. Um, and, but the, the biggest, uh, like the delineating deciding factor there is if for like something like flooring is if it's what the IRS calls non-permanent flooring. Um, okay. I guess if you're listening to this, so air quote, non-permanent flooring <laughs> <laughs> uh, versus permanent flooring. Okay. And um, so that would be like something comparing stuff like, like carpet, um, uh, LVP, um, like that kind of stuff is going to be non-permanent. It's, it's easily removable. And I hate to overgeneralize, but if it's kind of like the cheaper, like the lighter end types of flooring are usually going to be in a non-permanent, um, you know, description. Okay. Whereas when you get into stuff like tile and hardwood, you know, those are really, those are more in the permanent flooring type of uh, category because uh, which it'll, just logically, at least like that, like makes a little bit of sense because yeah, hopefully you're going to get a, a good lifespan out of something like hardwood floors. And then is this accelerated depreciation, is it like a one-time thing or like, let's say you go in there and rehab it, you know, as you buy it, but then, you know, three years and you, and you do the accelerated depreciation, but then three years down the line, oh, now I need a new roof or new AC or, oh, the flooring's ruined and I'm putting new flooring in. Can you do an ex another accelerated depreciation on an asset? Yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, it, it really depends on that situation of what the repairs actually are. But yes, if you say... Maybe you bought a property two years ago, you know, like in 2021, um, you did a cost seg and took bonus appreciation on a whole bunch of stuff. So, and, and it was back when it was 100%. So all that stuff was, you know, written off and deducted in a prior year. But then yeah. this year, yeah, you go in and you say, hey, um, whatever, this needs to be replaced, these components, or this is broken or something. Um, depending on what the improvement or the repair is, um, it may be bonus eligible, be it, but the okay. underlying idea there is that when you put that new set of flooring in or you put that new refrigerator in or something like that, that is new property that you're placing into service in 2023. So like in that situation, yeah, if you had an existing property that you put a new refrigerator in, great, that's new property. We'll take the 80% bonus appreciation on that refrigerator this year. Okay. And so do you necessarily need a cost segregation with each improvement or when you have an asset like that with the refrigerator and you just have the invoice or the receipt, um, does that work enough for the tax purposes? Yeah. If you know exactly what the items cost, like you've got an invoice or a receipt, then you don't need to have that done. Um, okay. The main purpose of the cost seg is to uh, is to provide that information when you don't have it. Because if you buy an yeah. existing, you know, a 25 year old home, 
um, you, you don't know how much cost went into the light fixtures and the countertop and everything. So that's what the study is doing. But um, same thing if you did like a rehab on a property, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you said, hey, we've had this for five years. Um, we, if we know if we completely remodel the kitchen that we'll be able to raise rent on it $300 a month. So let's go ahead and go in there and do that. Um, very similarly with that, you could have a $35,000 kitchen remodel or something that you do. But if you have all that information on the invoices, um, then you don't need that cost seg study because you've got all the data. Okay. No, that's super helpful. Yeah. I think for rehabbers mm -hmm. out there, you know, they think, oh, I got to do one more thing. What's the return on my investment for this additional yeah. study when I already paid for everything and have all my invoices. And so kind of speaking of that cost, like I, I know you're not the, a cost segregator, right? But like what generally speaking, like for a $500,000 single family home or like a million dollar multifamily home, what's a general cost for a cost segregation? Yeah, you, you, there's a couple of different methods, you know, and I would say like the quote unquote traditional method for cost segregation would be to have an engineering study performed. Okay. Um, and these are, this is the version of cost segs. I mean, they've been around for decades. So okay. there's some, you know, big firms that have been doing them for a very long time. Um, but, you know, they, they will essentially send somebody out to do like a walkthrough, almost like an inspection, um, okay. similar to talking about like an appraiser would to take a look at the property and they're going to break down all those components. Um, those are more, obviously more labor intensive and they're a little bit more expensive. So, you know, for something like, yeah, if it's a single family home and we're talking about like a, you know, 500,000, 800,000 dollar home type of thing, um, you're, you're probably looking at. Uh, a few thousand dollars. Like I, okay. I see those range twenty five hundred to four thousand, give or take. That's kind of what I've heard it. before too, about two to three grand, two to four grand, somewhere around there. Um, yeah. And then is it much more when you're talking about like a million dollar, two million dollar? Maybe you're looking at a ten, twenty, thirty unit, you know, multifamily property. Is it kind of exponential? Yeah. Is it per door? What what kind of costs are maybe someone looking at for that? Yeah, they, they, it's, it gets way more uh, subjective. There's way more variables when you're dealing mm -hmm. with like a multifamily structure. Um, because And the big thing I'll say too, is it doesn't necessarily hinge too much on, on price per se, but more like the complexity of the property. So, okay. you know, if you have um, a, a 30 unit, you know, complex that is, uh, you know, very basic where you've got 15 units that are um, two bedroom, one bath, and they're all just mirror images and they all have similar finishings and stuff like that. That's going to be easier. a lot faster, kind of a lickety split type of thing. Um, yeah. It'd be different if you had a really unique property, you know, that had like a mixture of, well, there's some three twos, some two twos, some two ones. And we have these, the ones on the top floor are kind of like high grade. And then we've got like a little bit cheaper ones down on the ground floor or something like that. Those are the types right. of things that are going to, make the study a lot more complex, take more time and, and end up okay. costing more. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's a big that variable makes, once you start getting into those. Makes, mm -hmm. makes total sense. So um, like what portions or what assets are you able to depreciate? Like, are you able to depreciate land? Is it just single families uh, or residential properties, commercial properties? Like what, what assets can you depreciate? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, it really is uh, going to be any kind of real estate that has some kind of a, some kind of a structure. So structure. Uh, the the land itself, like the dirt, literally is not depreciable at all. You know, okay. so when you acquire property, that land value it just it sits on your tax return. Um, you know, with with its its base value, it never depreciates. Okay. Um, it's so it's all everything that's going to be depreciable is going to be actually like in the structure. Um, or almost, you know, I'd almost want to just say like above ground. And the reason why I say okay. that is you can have things that are like like a fence, a fence in the backyard. So not necessarily part of the building, but that's depreciable property. So uh, maybe the, a better way to put it is any improvements that are made to the property. Uh, okay. Some, another one would be like a driveway. The driveway is depreciable property. Okay. No, that's helpful. Um, can passive investors benefit from bonus depreciation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of times investors will hear uh, some of the, the rules and uh, regulations around something like real estate professional status, and we don't necessarily need to jump into all the details of that today. But for people who aren't aware, it's, it's a pretty heavy lift. You've got to yeah. put at least 750 hours into real estate in order to be able to achieve that. So it's, it's not easy uh, by any means. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people will hear that and say, oh, okay, if I can't qualify for that, you know, is something like a cost seg and bonus appreciation going to matter for me? Do I even need to bother? Do I need to worry about that? 
Um, and it's that that would be the the passive investor, somebody who's going okay. to at least have their losses categorized as passive. Um, and if you if your losses are passive, what that means is you can't use the losses to offset non-passive income, which would be like your W-2, other business income, um, really kind of anything that's like an active, uh, daily active source of income for you. So, um, and, and ideally we wanna be able to use those losses to offset any type of income if we want to. But for that passive investor, I would say it still is can be very beneficial, um, depending on all the facts and circumstances, of course, but um, it's the reason why the benefit shifts a little bit for the passive investor is since you're not able to take those losses all in year one and they're gonna be passive and suspended to be carried forward, uh -huh. um, it'll take you a few years to really feel the effects of the tax savings. Because uh -huh. let's say you have that cost seg generate a loss for you and it generates $90,000 of losses and they get suspended and carried forward. Well, the only thing you can offset those passive losses with then is passive income. Well, you're gonna have passive income from your rental property in years two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Um, the nice thing with that is when you have that income generated by your property in those future years, those passive losses will absorb it, which means you're effectively getting all this cash flow from your property for several years tax free. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you might have that $90,000 loss carry forward. And if you're generating $15,000 of income, you know, passive income, give or take each year. That means for the first six years, um, you'll have that $15,000 going into your pocket tax free. Tax -free um, yeah. So it's really very beneficial. It's just so you have a little bit more uh, delayed gratification, I guess would be yeah. <laughs> a, way, a way to look at it if you're a passive investor. I like that. And then maybe like a, like a real specific question. Um, if you're in a syndication with like a self-directed IRA and you're a limited mm -hmm. partner in that situation, right. Then is, a, a, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, there's no accelerated or there's no depreciation available to a self-directed IRA. Is that true? Um, it's not entirely accurate. I wouldn't say okay. quite in that fashion. So okay. I would say that your self-directed IRA is mostly not going to uh, benefit, you know, or you were actually, what I should say is you're not going to benefit from your IRA receiving some of that depreciation because okay. the tax benefits are in a way, I don't want to, it sounds negative to say it this way, but they're trapped inside the IRA. So that depreciation yeah. is not ever going to make it to you as the investor. It's going to be stuck inside the IRA. The reason okay. why I would say it still can be beneficial for self-directed IRA uh, investors is something that a lot of investors are very unaware of is there can be some pitfalls with investing through your retirement accounts. And specifically with, uh, with IRAs is there is a tax that can be levied on IRAs, which is really like, it's a big surprise uh, most of the time because most people are thinking like, yeah, I, everything I do inside my IRA is gonna be tax-free, tax that's part of the benefit of you know the retirement account, which mm -hmm. normally is the case if you were doing something Kind of like traditional IRA where it's being put in an index fund, it's you're trading stocks with it or something like that. Um, with real estate, though, we have leverage get introduced. Okay. So, you know, I mean, uh, I don't think I've ever come across a syndication that wasn't using some form of leverage, like some form of debt. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the way that it works with retirement with the, the IRAs specifically is if your IRA makes an investment into a syndication and it, that syndication is using leverage to acquire a property, the portion of your income that's generated through that investment that's going back to the IRA, um, it will be pro rata portioned to something called unrelated debt financed income, which is a very, very big mouthful. We call it UDFI for short. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and that portion of the income is actually taxable to your IRA your IRA has to pay tax on that portion of income. Um, and unfortunately, your IRA actually has to file a tax return as well because of that. Okay. Um, so, but the, the key there with that is the IRA has, has, has to pay tax on the taxable income that is the pro rata portion of how much is allocated to the, the leverage. Okay. Um, so, so to kind of like put a real example to that, if the syndication is using a 70% loan to acquire the property, Mm -hmm. then basically 70% of the income that goes to your IRA will be taxable. Um, and there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's kind of trimming out some of the nasty details. Okay. Um, 
Now, why depreciation can be a benefit there is um, the key in that, as I said, 70% of the taxable income will mm -hmm. be taxable to the IRA. Well, if there's enough depreciation there to wipe out taxable income, then you're not as concerned with UDFI because yeah, if there's not any taxable income going there, then, then we're great. Uh, at some point, there's going to be taxable income because sure. syndication model, typically you're going to have that disposition maybe within five years, seven years, whatever their timeline is. Um, and, and you'll have uh, some UDFI at that point. So uh, needless to say, there's a lot of planning <laughs> that can go around sure. investing through your retirement accounts. Um, or uh, to keep it simpler, you can do investments that are not utilizing leverage to kind of avoid all of those complexities. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for explaining that. Because yeah, that's always one of those little tricky questions to answer for other investors and uh, one that tends to come up a lot in conversations I have. Mm -hmm. um, why would an investor maybe not want to use bonus depreciation? Can you help me there? Like why some tax professionals might recommend against claiming bonus depreciation? Yeah. Yeah. So there's very few instances where I would potentially recommend a client not claim bonus depreciation or to okay. not have a cost seg and claim bonus. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll hit that one first. That way we can squash all of the other bogus reasons that some tax professionals will recommend against it. Because <laughs> uh, we do see some wild <laughs> explanations sometimes from uh, clients <laughs> that are saying, my last CPA told me X, Y, Z. Um, so a legitimate reason why I would suggest not doing it is if you're very unsure about how long you're planning on holding the property. So, you know, if you're thinking like, hey, I'm, I'm buying this, it's, 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 it's a market I'm not sure about. I've never bought one in this city or in this location, or I've never bought a property in this class, whatever that particular doubt may be. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody's telling me, yeah, if it doesn't go the way I want to, I, I might sell it in 18 months to two years or something if it's not, if it's not going well. So, and the reason why I'd say that is when you sell a property that you've claimed any depreciation on, but it's exacerbated when you've claimed bonus depreciation because we've taken a lot more, um, you will have depreciation recapture. And a lot of people uh, will refer to that as quote unquote, paying back your, the depreciation that you took, yeah. which is a bit of a misnomer, but it's not entirely inaccurate. Um, it's you're picking that depreciation back up as income, essentially. So you're, you're okay. paying taxes on it at that point when you sell. Um, okay. So if you never sell the property, that's not even a concern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you keep it. Um, is there a the rule other, of thumb, like cost wise? Like, so are you paying back dollar per dollar on that money? Like, what what kind of average is is that recapture? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's another big it depends type of scenario, okay. but <laughs> mostly it's going to be dollar for dollar. Now, um, some of the variables that could come into play is what tax bracket are you? You know, so if you take the bonus depreciation this year and you're in a 35% tax bracket, um, you're going to be taking those deductions at, at that level. And yeah. so the actual amount of tax dollars that you receive are going to be 35 cents on the dollar. Now, if you sell it in two years and maybe it's like uh, after you have, I don't know, quit your W-2 job or you have like other investments that are producing losses, mm -hmm. depending on what's going on in that year, maybe when you sell, you're in a 24% tax bracket. And yes, you'll have all those deductions will dollar for dollar get picked up as income. But in that year of sale, if you're in a lower tax bracket, the amount of tax that you'll pay back will actually be less. That could swing the other way and it be that you're in a higher tax bracket as well. Um, so that would be one thing that we would always consider like on the planning side um, or around the disposition is kind of like, what are the effects here when you sell? Okay. Um, but I would say the, the other potential option you have for like the workaround is why when, when uh, we hear tax advisors or tax uh, professionals tell their clients like, oh, don't take bonus, you'll have to pay it back when you sell the property, is you do have the option to engage in a 1031 exchange, okay. which allows you to defer all the depreciation recapture as well as the capital gains. You know, ideally, if your property has gone up in value, you might actually have some appreciation as well. Yeah. Um, so that's a potential workaround. And I would say like the argument against. No, that's um, amazing. Cause you always hear about 1031 exchanges and you hear bonus appreciation. And I actually didn't know you got both benefits, right? So it just mm -hmm. it makes a ton of sense to 1031 to do the bonus appreciation than 1031. And, and I mean, I, I know I, you've even said this, I think before, but you're, you're kind of kicking the can down the cur you know, down the road. But if you never sell that asset, you're really not, you're just never having to pay taxes on that. 
um, which is nice. Um, right, did it, right. did we, did we miss anything? Are there any other ways you can avoid depreciation recapture? Is it just like that 1031 exchange or not selling the asset basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the okay. two main ones. Um, and I mean, I would say, de again, depending on what's going on in the year you sell, um, mm -hmm. you potentially may be able to um, uh, just buy another asset that you claim bonus appreciation on in that year. That yeah. would help you offset the gain that you would have on the sale. Um, some some people refer to that as a lazy 1031 exchange okay. <laughs> um, and as, as a kind of a nickname. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that would be the other kind of main way to to avoid that. So. Okay. Did I miss any questions or anything that we should share with the audience about depreciation? Um, I think we covered almost everything, but I, uh, what, what else is there? What else can we share with the audience? Yeah. So I, I would add to just that, that whole recapture conversation is, um, you know, uh, some people say, well, what if, what if I don't want to do a 1031 exchange? Cause I don't want to, I don't want to have to reinvest into more real estate maybe. Yeah. Um, that's where I would say, um, okay, well that's where we need to talk about the long, the longer term holds, because even if you don't do a 1031 exchange or you don't buy another property to have new bonus offset or something like that, and you do, you are just willing to pay that recapture tax. Yeah. Um, one thing that I always, you know, when we're looking at investments, right, where I was talking to investors about like, okay, if you save 40,000, what are you going to do with it? Like, are you going to reinvest it into something else? And generally that's the case, like not always. Yeah. But if you derive those major, major tax benefits on the front end um, and say, you know, you, you save $50,000 in taxes. Well, theoretically, if you take that 50,000, you invest it into another property or stocks, stocks or some other kind of investment. If you think about what kind of annual rate of return you can generate on that fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and maybe maybe you get 12 percent annual rate of return on some other investment, well, that would be another five to six thousand dollars of income each year that you wouldn't have had otherwise if you had just yeah. not taken the depreciation you forked it over, um, you know, to Uncle Sam. Well, if you get five years down the road and you've generated twenty five thirty thousand dollars of returns, um, like on that money. If worst case scenario, you have to pay that depreciation recapture and you're effectively giving that $50,000 back in taxes to the government, you still have all that um, all that investment return that you yeah. have during that, say, five or six years. Um, and so like a lot of times we'll say this is almost like you getting a no interest loan from the government because <laughs> there's no interest in that situation. You're yeah. just picking it up as a new tax. So that's why we would say, um, you know, the short term hold it eliminates some of that benefit. But if you're willing to hold that property for, you know, five-ish years, you can draw, derive a lot of benefit by just having that money, your money, stay in your pocket or go into additional investments and whatnot. No, I love that. Yeah, I love that. So, and it's like, and that's part of the planning, right? Like when you're buying these assets or making your game plan, these are the sort of considerations you have to have um, mm -hmm. or the ways you can really save a ton of money or even buy another asset based on the tax savings you get from one, you know, but, um, I think we talked about it a little bit the last time it was like, I almost, I, I did the mistake of like, Hey, I took them, I took some money and then I didn't buy the purchase the one year. And then it's like, well, I almost paid a bunch of money back in taxes, you know, when I should have just bought another asset, um, and kind of made that mistake. Um, you know, one other question I had was, uh, I've seen some headlines out there, right? Like the sexy uh, headlines trying to, you know, get our attention that maybe bonus depreciation that 100% might be extended for this year. Is there any truth to that rumor or anything that you insider information, you know? Yeah, there is actually. So we're not holding our breath by any means, but, okay. you know, we, um, I, I, it's funny, I actually uh, predicted that this would come up two years ago because <laughs> we, we, wondered, we wondered how long it would be before they would start talking about it. Of course, yeah. we waited until this year uh, because it's it's going down. But uh, yeah, there is a, a bill that in its current form, it's, it's the Build It in America Act, I believe is what, it's, what they've called it, okay. um, that would reinstate bonus appreciation up to 100% and it would make it go through 2026. So okay. like right now it's 80% this year and it stair steps down 20% each year. So it eventually yeah. will go down to 20% and then eventually zero um, in 2026, 2027. Um, but yeah, that, that current version, that bill would raise bonus up to hundred percent and eliminate that stair stepping down that it's going to do. Gotcha. Um, there, uh, obviously there's the two sides of the aisle kind of, 
you know, with their different bargaining chips that they are, uh, you know, saying, oh, we'll give you that if you give it this kind of thing. So sure. uh, we'll see. I mean, um, I, I'm cautiously optimistic. Sure. It's always funny when they make those deadlines or something happens. And then as soon as it hits, it's like, oh, wait, we didn't think that we need a couple more years. So I'm, I got my fingers crossed for a little bit uh, of that extension would be nice. Um, mm -hmm. But really appreciate it. This was an awesome conversation. And I think uh, I gained a lot of value from it. I know a lot of people out there and everyone that listens to it will gain a ton of value uh, about this discussion on, on depreciation, how you can best utilize it as an investor. And um you know, the best place for the hot REI community to connect with Justin is going to be at the real estate CPA.com backslash Justin Shore um, or on the real estate CPA podcast at a uh, www.taxsmartinvestors.com. We'll, of course, include all Justin's contact information and the links in our show notes. Justin, thanks again for joining me today, man. You always drop a ton of knowledge and value to, to the audience. So can't thank you enough, man. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks, Travis. Yeah. And then to the audience, thank you for tuning in today and commit to taking action today to move your investing forward. Take care and God bless. Thank you for listening to the Hot Real Estate Investing Podcast. Check out our website, hotrei.com, for additional content and resources. And please take a moment to subscribe and leave a review so we can continue to bring even more value to others through real estate investing.